Oh, hey guys, hey guys. I'm doing much better than what I was doing earlier. You know, we get these little, uh, little storms to try to come up in our life, and we just have to ride them out, and uh, they do go away. But, uh, you know, I said I was going to tell y'all about this short story. Um, what's the name of the story? Seven Floors by Dino Baziati. Baziati. This story I, I read a long time ago, too. It's very short. It's shorter than The Bound Man. But it's a story about this man. He, um, it was a lot of illness, illnesses going on, you know, like, I don't think it was the plague, but it was something that was killing people. People were dying. And this man named uh, Gi Giuliani Corte, he felt that he was getting sick. And, you know, a slight fever. So he decided he would check himself into a, a sanitarium. That's what they called hospitals back then. So he thought he would get a a jump on and check himself in before he got real sick. He goes through the preliminaries and check himself in. And uh, the doctors, they were pretty thorough. And he was talking about how the story is told in the third person. So he was, he, the story talks about how pristine the hospital is and it has seven floors. So, when he got admitted, they put him on the seventh floor. And it goes on. Now, this is a story you can download if you're interested. And, you know, I don't expect everybody to be interested in what I like. But I just like short stories. So, anyway, so, they, they admitted him on the seventh floor. And he you know, did what they told him to do and they, his medicine and what he's supposed to do. And they told him that, you know, you really don't look this sick. So, but we'll take care of you anyway. So he ended up staying on this floor for about 10 weeks, but he, he could only look out. They had a little balcony. He could look out and look down across at the other floors and he noticed other people looking out their windows. But on the first floor, it didn't seem to be any life on that floor. But he would go to his little treatment room and meet some of the other patients. And he noticed that they were going to other floors. You didn't leave his hospital and check out. They would just put you on a lower floor because he was at the highest floor. They would uh, put him on another floor, a lower floor. That's what they would do. But he he wasn't feeling worse, but he wasn't feeling better. And so his doctors told him that they were going to let him go to the sixth floor. He was kind of worried. He said, well, am I getting worse? Is that why I have to go to the lower floor? And they told him, no, the doctors on the sixth floor were more equipped to handle his case because they had done all they could do on the seventh floor. So they sold it to him and he, he kind of bought it and he went on down to the, the sixth floor and he expected to see some of his old friends from the seventh floor, but they weren't there. So he assumed that they had... Um, Move down to the fifth floor, you know, and so that he kind of, you know, figured out how it was going, but he still wasn't feeling any worse, but he wasn't feeling any better either. So he got acquainted with the doctors on the sixth floor and looking out the windows and he could see what's going on. Still no activity on the first floor. As the story goes on, you know, you kind of sit and try to figure out okay what's going on with these different floors and 
if he's not getting any sicker, then what is, I mean, what are they doing? He's not getting better, but he's, you know, he was getting worse a little bit, but, you know, it wasn't any improvement. So he, he managed to go down to the fifth floor. Different team of doctors and a whole different team, and they was telling him what they were going to do. But on the fifth floor, they got to the fifth floor, he noticed that he had some sores on his body. And the um, it looked like, uh, I think he said it was uh, blue spots, like it was bruises. And they told him there wasn't nothing to worry about. But they told him if he goes to the fourth floor, they could treat it before it gets any worse. And he kind of felt it was a gimmick. He, why couldn't y'all treat this on the on the fifth floor? And they said, no, we don't have the equipment. So they convinced him to not to fight him and don't argue and go on to the fourth floor. But he he really didn't want to go. So he put up a big fight. They almost had to tie him down and take him to that floor on a gurney. That's how upset he was about going to a lower floor. But anyway, he finally stopped fighting and went on down. And he noticed his appetite was getting worse. And he got down to the fourth floor. They would give him these treatments. And he saw some the, how the patients were. And they were, everybody was getting those treatments. But they seemed to be in a worse shape than he was. So he that made him feel a little better. And but the bliss, the uh, bruises on his legs, they started oozing and getting worse. And the therapies took longer. And nobody told him what to expect uh, with these blisters. And you know, with the disease, he just didn't know what to expect. And when he wasn't getting any better, they told him, Well, we've done all we could on this floor, so. The doctors on the third floor, we promise you, they are, they, they, if anybody can cure you, they can on the third floor. So by this time, he could, he could barely walk. They took him to the third floor on a stretcher. So he had hope that on the third floor, he would get better. So on the third floor, they did what they could and try to get him in his appetite and you know working with him but he just it just wasn't improving and he had been there I forgot how many months but he'd been there for a long time and then next thing they know he's on the second floor and he could barely go to the window and look out the window and he could hardly hold his head up and look out the window and you know it was just not, not, he wasn't feeling good. He just, but he didn't fight it anymore. So, the next thing he knew, they got him on the first floor. And when he got there, it, it wasn't any pain or anything. He just noticed how it wasn't any light on the first floor. And... The light that he thought he saw, it really wasn't light. He just remember. he said, um, I mean, the story writer says that all he remember was the light that he saw, that they were pulling the shades down. And the story goes off like that. And I thought it was a, I don't know, a strange way, but the story is uh, for a story to end, but it's open to interpretation. This is the last paragraph. It says, but why is the room suddenly so dark? It was still early afternoon. With supreme effort, Giuliani Corte, who felt himself paralyzed by a strange stupor, looked at his watch on the night sign next, stand next to his bed. 3.30, he turned his head to the side and saw that the shades, obeying a mysterious command, 
was slowly lowering, blocking out the passage of light. So, you know, you, this is the way I see the story. It is about life. You know, we come in here, everybody comes here on, say, the seventh floor. You know, you're in the height. Well, you're not even sick. You're not even in the hospital. But in the when you in the prime of your life, you're on the seventh floor, and you watch people go. They they come and they go. But each floor is a level of your life, and as you graduate, go down, down, down. People who live to have a full life, they get to go through the seven floors. And people who die suddenly, they don't. But this is what this story is about to me, the seven floors. And this guy, his experiences of being ill and accepting his own death. That's what that story means to me. But... That that I like that story too, but the bound man. Well, they, I like both of them, but I got a quite a few stories, and I guess um maybe next time I don't have enough time now. But this is a book. Let me show you. It's called um, "It Takes a Village." We were once children. This is a a book my son and I co-wrote together. I wrote the little short stories and he, he writes the assessments on it. And it's about maybe seven little short stories. And I'm not going to talk that much about it. Well, no, I don't, I'm not going to, because I got to pick which story I want to read. But it's eight short stories um, about different you know, synopsis of people raising their children. And my son comes in and writes his assessment of how he would have, in modern time, how he would have disciplined a child. But next time I come on, I'll do that. But I was going to talk about, you know, we were talking about um, hypnosis in a couple of earlier videos and I, you know, I, I mentioned group hypnosis one time, and I went to one. It was a big auditorium of people, and we were all sitting in these, these comfortable recliners. I would say it was about maybe 30 recliners and 30 people in the, in the auditorium, and they were supposed to start the hypnosis, say, at 2 o'clock. The room was freezing cold. I mean, just cold as it want to be. And these people didn't show up till maybe an hour later. And the room is so cold, you can't even be mad. But the recliners make you comfortable. So we next thing you know, I'm, I was trying to get mad for them holding us up so long. But I started nodding off. And the... the um, the hypnotist, he finally comes in on the stage and he talks a little bit. And before we went in, um, came in the auditorium, they they tell us that they would give you hypnosis if you wanted to stop smoking, you want to lose weight, or you have certain addictions to sugar. That's what it was, sugar, yeah. So anyway, he comes and he talks and he has just this calm voice. And I don't know what he did. You could hear him talking. And when it came to him talking about sugar, I mean, he was talking about the cigarettes first and I didn't smoke. So that didn't apply to me. So it's like I couldn't hear the cigarette part. But when he was talking about the sugar, I could hear. I don't know how he did that. So I heard him talk about your addictions of sugar and everything was going to taste sweet. You just couldn't you couldn't stand the taste of sugar. It's going to set your teeth on the edge. The sugar was going to make you sick. And the next thing I know, he was you could hear him an amplified sound of somebody snapping their fingers. And next thing you know, you're wide awake. 
And I don't even remember going to sleep. But anyway, so the thing was over and everybody was getting out of the auditorium and the girl that came with me, we was in the parking lot and glad to be in the parking lot because it was warm out there. And the first thing she did was she said, Mary girl, I got to light up a cereal. <laughs> so she goes to light up her cigarette and she takes a puff and she said, oh, what brand of cigarettes is this? She stomped it. She said, this thing is so nasty. And I didn't say nothing. I was saying, well, maybe she bought the wrong brand. I didn't know. And she got in her car and she said, oh, my God, it stinks. It's been smelling like this all the time. I said, I said, Marlene, what you talking about? She said, oh, my God, oh, I can't stand this smell. So she rambled through her purse and sprayed some perfume. But her car smelled like cigarettes. So she couldn't even stand the smell of her car. And it kind of dawned on me. I said, oh, maybe that hypnosis to the cigarettes worked. But the key to this thing was... You had, they wanted you to call this number every day and they gave you some, uh, some cassette tapes. That's how long ago it was. We were listening to cassette tapes, but you had to listen to these cassette tapes. They asked you to do this and call in every day to get what they call reprogram. So, but anyway, Marlene and whatever he did to her, it was working. And I said, um, well, maybe it worked, but Marlene Carr was stinky anyway. I don't know how she couldn't smell those cigarettes. But anyway, so I kind of forgot about my sugar habit because I had a chocolate cake at the house. And when I got home, in my mind, I said, ooh, I'm going to get me some chocolate cake and some milk. And not even thinking about the hypnosis. So... I think it was the last slice of cake. You know how your kids do. They might sla save you a little corner. So I got the chocolate cake, and put on a salsa, go to the refrigerator and put me a nice cold glass of milk. And I started drinking the milk. I took, you know, some in my mouth and took one swallow and I spit it out. I was screaming. I was yelling at the kids and. They came running. What's wrong, mama? What's wrong? I say, what? Who? Why did y'all put sugar in this milk? I was so mad. It was, it was just horrible. And my son said, mama, why nobody put no sugar in no milk? Why would we do that? And it dawned on me. I was like, oh, man, that was that hypnosis. <laughs> so, man... I couldn't even drink the milk because it was too sweet. And I didn't even bother with the chocolate cake. I, I say, y'all eat this last piece of chocolate cake and I can't do this. So I, I, I realized the hypnosis had worked. So mm -hmm. I called the, the next day I called the um, hotline or whatever mm -hmm. it was and listened to my tapes and that that hypnosis it worked as long as you kept programming yourself until you were able to stand alone on your ideas that you you don't want sugar and i think marlene she didn't keep hers up because she went back to smoking she was stopped smoking for about i think about two months yeah she she did pretty good and the sugar i didn't i it lasts with me for about, I'd say, maybe a month, almost a month. But, you know, you had, I think, so many free phone calls. And then after that, they want you to pay some more money. And I said, oh, this is a gimmick. I'm not paying no more money. So, but it did work. That group hypnosis did work. Or either... Maybe I, my mind, me and Marlene, our minds, we were, I don't know, good candidates. But I think what they were doing was setting the stage for you to relax and making it cold in that room. And those recliners were there for a purpose, for us to relax mentally. And they came in late for that reason, too. So we were good and ready for hypnosis by the time they did that. But I thought I'd give you that, you guys, that little tidbit on the group hypnosis. So it did work. And um, 
we'll we'll talk um, about hypnosis again because I got a lot of material on hypnosis, and I wanted I, I I can't tell you guys about Reiki because during the initiation process, you know, I'm a a one level one and two. I'm not a master, and you take. I won't say vows, but you promise that you won't reveal this to people that are not trying to be initiated. So I wouldn't dare tell you guys about Reiki. And you can't just go say, I want to take a Reiki class. They don't do that. You have to be on the path of initiation and you pay your fees. You have to have a master to teach you uh, level one and it, it takes some time and then it takes some more time to advance to level two and I don't know I I, 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 I have a certificate that says level three master but I wasn't satisfied with the because I had went to a different master and they were, he wasn't thorough. And the other levels, I had to pay some big money. I mean, it was like $300. And this fellow was doing level three, a master's. He wasn't charging but $100. So, you know, you get what you pay for. So I don't feel confident saying that I'm a, a Reiki master. I, I don't feel like I should say that. So I'm going to see when the lady who initiated me in one and two, when she can do classes again. And it depends on my money, too, because it costs a whole lot more money now to do that. So I, I won't tell you guys anything about Reiki, but we'll talk some more about hypnosis. And remember, I'm going to read some, um, at least one story in this this book that my son and I wrote okay but anyway that's enough for tonight I'll talk to you guys later bye, bye.